Prepare for a rude awakening. Shalom, Torah fans. This is Michael Rood on the Golan Heights in Israel above the beautiful Sea of Galilee. In our last episode, we began exploring the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew's Gospel with Dead Sea Scroll scholar Nehemia Gordon from Jerusalem. Nehemia laid the critical linguistic foundations so we now clearly understand that the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew's Gospel could not be a retranslation back to the Hebrew from a later Greek text because it maintains the original Hebrew linguistic construction and Hebrew figures of speech that are absent from all extant Greek manuscripts. We also learned that the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew that was copied by Jewish physician Shem Tov Ibn Shaprut in 1390 of the Common Era was later updated or corrected to read more closely to the common Greek text. But now that we have a much more original version of Matthew's Gospel to work with, a Hebrew Matthew, do we have the information we need to solve the problem that started our quest? Remember, it was two days before Passover when Yeshua made his final public address to his disciples and the multitude gathered on the Temple Mount. He emphatically declared, according to the King James Version, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatsoever they command you to do and observe, that do. The Greek and English versions of Matthew's Gospel tell us that Yeshua commanded his disciples to obey the rabbis. Yet in his next breath, he said that these religious leaders were responsible for shutting their followers out of the kingdom of heaven. How are we to reconcile Yeshua's words that we must do and observe all that the rabbis command because they sit in Moses' seat with his routine breaking of Pharisaic rules and regulations with nearly every miracle that he performed? I prayed for the truth to be revealed to us in Jerusalem, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, led us into a truth that has been buried for nearly 2,000 years. But I'm going to let Nehemiah tell you the rest of the story in episode seven of the 10 part series, Raiders of the Lost Book, Discoveries in the Ancient Hebrew Text of Matthew's Gospel. When I first learned of this, I thought this is incredible. How could this be that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew? That's, that's ridiculous. How, you know, okay, you bring me these linguistic arguments, but you can't just show up after 2,000 years and tell me the book was written in Hebrew. You have to have some kind of earlier evidence for this, earlier than Shem Tov, Ibn Shaprut. And the, my first question was really, okay, there are, the New Testament is preserved from the 3rd century and onwards in 5,000 manuscripts. And every one of those 5,000 manuscripts is in what language? It's in Greek. So how could Matthew have been written in Hebrew if there are 5,000 Greek manuscripts? And my next question was, okay, those manuscripts are maybe from a few hundred years after Matthew wrote the Gospel, maybe in the earlier period there would be some type of testimony that would have to prove that it was written in Hebrew, maybe from one of the church fathers. And I said, I said, okay, if Matthew was really written in Hebrew, how come none of the church fathers tell us that? And I actually investigated and found out that they do tell us that. They tell us that as a fact. Papias was one of the early church fathers who lived from 60 to 130 of the Common Era, and he's referred to as a disciple of a man named John the Presbyter, who you know as the author of the Gospel of John. And Papias, with his inside information, he says matter-of-factly, in the beginning of the second century, less than a hundred years after Yeshua's ministry, he says, Matthew collected the words in the Hebrew language. He states this as a fact, a universally known and recognized fact, that Matthew wrote his Gospel in the Hebrew language. And he goes on and he says, and each translated them as best he could. That's very interesting, that second half, because what he's uh, reflecting here is a recognition that it was a very difficult thing to translate this gospel from Hebrew into, into other languages, and everybody did their best. They might not have always been very successful, but they did the best they could to translate these things into other languages from the Hebrew. Well, let's look at some of these manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. 
This is a manuscript from St. Petersburg, the St. Petersburg Manuscript. And uh, Shame to Hebrew Matthew actually was published in 1987 based on the nine manuscripts that were available at the time. This manuscript from St. Petersburg was at that time behind the Iron Curtain, and the Soviets wouldn't let anyone look at it. And it wasn't used when Shame to Hebrew Matthew was published. And because of that, the present publication uh, based on the nine manuscripts is really an incomplete picture of what's contained within this document because it wasn't based on all of the manuscript evidence. And this is really a fascinating manuscript because this is the first time this manuscript is being seen in the Western world. The first time this manuscript is being shown here. This is an unpublished manuscript, and who knows what's contained in these pages. Now, when I went to look at this manuscript in Jerusalem, actually this is uh, in St. Petersburg in the former Soviet Union in the city that was previously known as Leningrad. And with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, a delegation of Israeli scholars went over to St. Petersburg and they began to microfilm all the Hebrew manuscripts they could get their hands on, literally to photograph every single page. And when I went to St. Petersburg, or I went to, when I went to look at the St. Petersburg manuscript in Jerusalem, I took it out, and when I brought it back to the librarian at Israel's National Library, he said to me a very interesting thing. He said, Nehemiah, was there anything interesting in that manuscript? And I thought that was a very strange question. I'd looked at many manuscripts. I've never had the librarian ask me if there's anything interesting there. That's just not his job. And I said, why are you asking me that question? And he said, because no one has ever checked out that manuscript to look at it before. This has been sitting in Israel for the last more than 10 years, and no one had looked at this manuscript, no one had studied it, quite simply because there are thousands of these Hebrew manuscripts that have been uncovered from the so former Soviet Union, and it will take generations and generations of Hebrew scholars to uh, study all these manuscripts and decipher them, and no one's gotten around to this one. It's simply, you can imagine that, Hebrew manuscripts of New Testament books are not very high on the agenda of some Israeli scholars. Uh, so who knows what's contained within the pages of this manuscript? No one knows. Well, I know, but really no one knows because no one studied it. And what uh, revelations of truth are waiting to be revealed by studying this document? Here's another unpublished manuscript, which is the Breslau or Breslau manuscript. This is also originated in a city in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union. However, today this manuscript is not in Breslau. It's actually in Prague. And there's a very interesting story behind this unpublic, unpublished manuscript as well. In the 1940s, the Nazis ransacked Europe looking for Jewish artifacts, uh, Judaica articles of artwork and manuscript and Torah scrolls, anything they could get their hands on. And they brought them all to Prague and they set them up in a museum which the Nazis called the Museum of the Extinct Race because the goals of the Nazis was to make the Jews extinct. And actually, to this very day, that's the largest collection of Judaica in the world, this former museum of the extinct race. And uh, who's extinct today and who isn't? That's a testimony, I think. Uh, we're still here. Uh, this, is a, this is another manuscript. This manuscript actually is published. This is from the British Library. And the answer to our question of Matthew 23 can actually be found in this manuscript in the bottom five lines there, which is the section from Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. And when we read that in the Hebrew, we'll get a completely new understanding. Everything we'll, that we're seeing now, these contradictions, Matthew 15, don't obey the Pharisees. Matthew 23, do obey the Pharisees. Right now, we're struggling with this contradiction. When we read it in the Hebrew, everything will fall into place and we'll have a much clearer understanding Everything will make sense. Now, I want to give you some advice because I know this is a very long session, but this is stuff that uh, you, you won't learn anywhere else, and this is, this is really foundational stuff. What we're presenting here today is the tip of the iceberg. You don't even know the iceberg exists yet. We're just establishing the foundation to, really these are foundational things. And uh, here's the book that I wrote on this. It's called The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus. And as you may have guessed, the reason I've called it that is that uh, the way Yeshua's words are presented in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew is fundamentally different from the way they're portrayed in the Greek uh, version. And that's why I call it the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. And I, I highly recommend this book because this is really foundational stuff. And there's a lot more that I wasn't even, I'm not even going to be able to present here today. So really I recommend you get this book and read it a few times. Give it to your friends and to your rabbis and your pastors. So they can also share on, especially your rabbis and pastors, so they can share on this uh, very important topic, which really I lay some of the really foundations, which in future years uh, you'll see that amazing things are going to be revealed from this, this Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. So in Matthew chapter 23, we've seen that Yeshua says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They have this Mosaic authority. 
All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And here it really sounds that you, like Yeshua is saying very clearly, you must obey the Pharisees. They sit in the seat of Moses. You must obey whatever they command you to do if you're going to be obedient to what Yeshua says. Uh, well, we've already seen this doesn't really make sense. Matthew 15, Yeshua warns his disciples not to do according to the ways of the Pharisees. Their traditions of the elders transgress the Torah. However, in tw Matthew 23, he's saying obey whatever they tell you to do. If they tell you to put your right shoe on first in the morning, you better obey them because they have Mosaic authority. What's going on here? Well, the answer is here in the Hebrew. And if you can read this uh, old Hebrew script, and you, can already, you already know the answer. This is what it looks like transcribed into modern Hebrew print. And what Yeshua says there in Hebrew Matthew, chapter 23, verses 2 to 3, Yeshua says, <laughs> So there you have it. There you see it's very clear. Reading, uh, this is what it would look like translated into English. There Yeshua says, The Pharisees and sages sit upon the seat of Moses. Therefore all that he says to you diligently do. But according to their reforms and their precedents do not do because they talk but they do not do. Now that's a very... A uh, subtle difference between what you saw in the Greek, a difference of one single word, or primarily one single word. In the Greek, you shoot, or in the Greek it had said in Matthew, all that they say, you must obey all that they say, they being the Pharisees. In the Hebrew, he says, you must obey all that he says, he being Moses. So the difference of this one single word fundamentally changes Yeshua's message. What he's saying now is, Obey, if their claim to authority is that they sit in the seat of Moses, so do as Moses says. Obey Moses. They claim their authority as they're sitting in this, this ornate stone chair in the synagogue, sitting, they're teaching with supposed authority, sitting in the seat of Moses, so obey, obey Moses, do what Moses says. Now how did this happen? How do we change from they say to he says? Well, this is what it looks like in Hebrew, in the Hebrew manuscripts. And you can see it's very similar. It's almost identical. The difference between he says and they say is the difference of one single letter, the Hebrew letter Vav. This one single letter, the change of this one, the addition of this one single letter changed Yeshua's original message, which was an instruction to his disciples to obey Moses, to an instruction to his disciples to obey the Pharisees. So it changed his uh, message from something that made perfect sense. Their claim to authority is that they sit in the seat of Moses, so do what Moses says, to this message which contradicts his own words in Matthew 15, which is obey the Pharisees. He goes on there, Yeshua, in, in Hebrew Matthew, and he says, according to their reforms and their precedents, do not do. And the word I've translated here as reforms in Hebrew is takanot. We've heard that word before, so let's all repeat that word. Takanot. So takanot are these man-made laws like the washing of the hands, and Yeshua's warning his disciples not to do according to their takanot. And I translated this for as, before as enactments. A more precise dictionary definition of takanot is reforms that change biblical law. That's how the word is defined more precisely in the Jastro Dictionary, which is a standard dictionary of early rabbinical Hebrew, late Second Temple Hebrew, reforms that change biblical law. And the classic example of one of these man-made laws, these takanot, is the commandment to wash your hands of the rabbis before you eat bread. Well, now that we understand Matthew 23, and we see that Yeshua is not telling you to obey the Pharisees, he's telling you to obey Moses, we still have to go back at Matthew 15 and see what it says there in the Hebrew. If we started off with what, which, what was a contradiction in the Greek, we can't just look at the Hebrew of one passage and not the other. So now let's look at Matthew 15 in the Hebrew. And there we read, why do, you, why do you also, Yeshua says to the Pharisees, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Can anyone guess what the Hebrew word behind tradition is? The word is takanot. So not only is there no contradiction in the Hebrew between Matthew 15 and Matthew 23, but in the Hebrew there's a consistent message throughout the entire book. There's this consistent string that runs through the book that Yeshua is warning his disciples not to follow the takanot of the Pharisees, these man-made laws of the Pharisees. If we go on in Matthew 15 in the Hebrew, we read in verse 9, remember how in the Greek it said, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? And I mentioned that that was a paraphrase of Isaiah 29, 13, which says, learn commandments of men. Others translate this, learn commandments of men, learn by rote. 
In the Hebrew Matthew, there's the exact quote from Isaiah word for word. Learn commandments of men. Now that's very interesting. If Hebrew Matthew is supposedly this translation from Greek, wouldn't it have the Hebrew equivalent of teaching for doctrine of the commandments of men rather than the exact precise words of Isaiah? That's a very, very interesting. Uh, Yeshua goes on. He warns against the takanot of the Pharisees. He also warns against their precedents, not to do their precedents. And the word, Hebrew word for precedents is ma'asim. Ma'asim is a word we'll look at in a moment. But these are two really important words, takanot and ma'asim, because these are the two things that if you're disciples of Yeshua, that he's warning you not to do, the takanot and ma'asim. So let's all say those words together. Takanot and ma'asim. All right, so what are these ma'asim? Ma'asim are precedents. The literal meaning is actions or deeds. And in the Greek it translates this as ergon, which in your English you have works, the works of the Pharisees. But what are the works or the, or the actions or deeds of the Pharisees? In Pharisee terminology, ma'asim refers to precedents or acts or deeds that serve as precedents. And what, what do they mean by that? Well, we've already seen that Pharisee law needs to legislate every aspect of life, uh, literally from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night. And what is, a, uh, for example, the Pharisees t uh, command their disciples which shoe to put on first in the morning? So what does a Pharisee do when he comes to a new situation where, he, where uh, the oral law doesn't tell him what to do? For example, if he lives in a country where there, you don't have shoelaces, and he doesn't know which shoe to put on first in the morning because he doesn't know which one to tie first because there are no laces, so what he does is he combs the oral law looking for instruction, and he combs tradition and... Uh, man-made laws, and if he can't find any instruction on which shoe to put on first in the morning, if there are no laces, then he goes and he looks at the precedence of one of his rabbis. Meaning, he looks and he says, we know that such and such a rabbi on such and such an occasion put on his right shoe first even though he didn't have laces, and that becomes a precedent. That then establishes what the proper norm, the proper standard of behavior is. The assumption is this rabbi could not be sinning, and if he put on his right shoe first, even though he didn't have laces, that's the proper standard for behavior. And what Yeshua is saying is, don't look to the precedents of the Pharisees as the proper standard of behavior. Don't do according to their precedents. Do as Moses says, not according to their takanot and their ma'asim. Let's look quickly at, his, at, a, at an example of a precedent. This is a precedent brought in the Talmud, and it says a ma'aseh. Ma'aseh is singular for ma'asim, so a precedent. A precedent which Rabban Gamliel, you probably thought it was pronounced Gamaliel, uh, the correct pre Hebrew pronunciation is Gamliel, and Gamliel, as you all know, is, was the, the Pharisaical teacher of Shaul of Tarsus, of Paul. However, this is Gamliel's grandson, Gamliel II. So a precedent which Rabban Gamliel II and the elders were traveling in a ship when a Gentile made a ramp on which to descend, and Rabban Gamliel and the elders descended by it. Okay, so what on earth is this talking about? The Pharisees start off with the principle that if somebody builds something for you on the Sabbath, you may not use that. If they build a ramp for you on the Sabbath, you may not use that ramp. And so then they ask the question, what if the ramp is built on the Sabbath, but it's not specifically for me? May I use that ramp? And the oral law doesn't tell them what to do. So they go and they say, okay, we remember that one time Rabbi Gamliel II descended on such a ramp, and that tells us that this was the proper behavior and that such a thing is permissible. In other words, the behavior of the rabbi in a specific circumstance becomes the standard by which uh, one should behave by in the future. And what Yeshua is warning his disciples is, don't do according to their takanot, and don't do according to their ma'asim. Their claim to authority is that they sin the seed of Moses, so do as he says. Do as Moses says. Now, what we've seen up until now is that the words of Yeshua in the Greek, what we may venture to call uh, the Greek Jesus, because that's what he's called in Greek, Jesus, Jesus. The Greek Jesus, he's coming and he's changing Torah, adding to Torah, taking away. He's saying, oh, don't worry about not adding to the Torah. Do whatever the Pharisees tell you to do. If they tell you what shoe to put on first in the morning, put on, that, put on that right shoe first. Even though that contradicts what he said eight chapters earlier in Matthew 15. Now, we've seen now, on the other hand, the Hebrew Yeshua is actually telling people, do as Moses says. Their claim to authority is they sit in the seat of Moses. Do as he says. Do as Moses says. So the Hebrew Yeshua is actually, or Yeshua's words, as he's portrayed in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, is actually upholding Torah. Now, what about this statement, because they talk but they do not do? When I first read this, my question was, what do they talk and what don't they do? When we read this in the Greek, it's very clear that it's saying they're hypocrites. But now in the Hebrew, we have a whole new context. 
He's uh, not saying to obey the Pharisees, even though they don't do what they do themselves, what they say themselves. He's saying obey Moses. So what's this they talk and they do not do? What are they talking and what aren't they doing? And when I first read this, I really wasn't sure what the answer was. I wasn't so clear. And the answer came to me in a very roundabout way. Um, <clears throat> I'd received an email a number of years back from someone who was confusing Karaites and Samaritans. I mentioned to you that Karaites are strictly Old Testament Tanakh Jews. Samaritans, of course, you know from the New Testament, are the people the, in Samaria who worship on Mount Gerizim. Let's get a quick rundown of the difference. Karaites, of course, believe in the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament, whereas Samaritans believe only in the five books of Moses, the Torah, and their Torah is actually different than the Torah used by all the other Jews. In the Torah of the Samaritans, it commands them to worship on the high place on Mount Krizim, which is a mountain just outside of Nablus, of Shechem. And whereas the Karaites worship at Jerusalem and turn to Jerusalem in prayer, like King Solomon talks about in 1 Kings 8. Uh, of course, Karaites are Israelites or Jews, whereas Samaritans are Babylonians who were forcibly settled in the land of Israel by the Assyrian kings after the ten northern tribes were exiled from Israel. And the story of the Samaritans is really given in 2 Kings chapter 17, where it talks about how the ten tribes were exiled from Israel and the king of Assyria didn't want this to be an empty land, so he brought in these people from Kuthia, from Babylon, and settled them into the land of Israel, into the northern part of Israel. And it talks about how when they first settled in the land, they were attacked by a plague of lions. And they said, why are we being attacked by lions? It must be because we're not worshiping the local god. So they went to the king of Assyria and said, can you please give us a priest that will teach us how to worship the local god, who of course in this case is the god of Israel. So who does the king of Assyria send them? He sends them one of the priests from the ten northern tribes. This is one of the priests that had gotten the ten northern tribes exiled in the first place. And what he teaches them is the ways of the ten northern tribes that had gotten them exiled. And he brings with him the Torah, but he also at the same time teaches them to uh, do according to the ways of these ten tribes, worshiping at the high places, sacrificing outside of the temple in Jerusalem, on Mount Gerizim and other places. And then in 2 Kings 17, verse 34, it summarizes the ways of the Samaritans, and it says, Until this very day they do according to their former ways, according to their statutes and their judgments. This is how it reads in the Hebrew. They do not fear Jehovah, and they do not do. And then in the Hebrew, the words they do not do is isolated in such a way that it emphasizes those words. And then it completes the sentence and says, According to the Torah and commandments that Jehovah commanded the children of Jacob. So what don't the Samaritans do? They don't do according to the Torah. Now after I'd read Matthew 23 and then I reread this passage, I realized in Hebrew this sounds very similar. There's a similar style here. And it seemed to me that Yeshua was echoing the words of 2 Kings 17.34 about the Samaritans. And I think what he was saying is that just as the Samaritans of old do according to their statutes and their judgments, and they do not do according to the Torah, so to the Pharisees of his own era do according to their takanot and their ma'asim, their reforms and their precedents, and they talk Torah, but they don't do Torah. And what does he mean they talk Torah? They're sitting in the seat of Moses, talking Torah to you all day long, but what they're really telling you is not Torah. It's just in the guise of Torah, what they're really telling you are their own reforms and precedents, and they don't really do Torah. So again, what we've seen up till now is that in the Greek, we have this, uh, Jesus is coming along and changing Torah, saying obey the Pharisees, whereas in the Hebrew, he's actually upholding Torah. Now, in light of that, how do we explain this passage, Matthew 5? Matthew 5, six times, Yeshua says, in the Greek, he says, you have heard it said, but I say. And it really sounds, when you read, when it really sounds like when you read this in English, that Yeshua, or in the Greek, Jesus is coming along and changing entire Torah commandments, adding, taking away, modifying. So what's going on? Did he uphold Torah or did he not uphold Torah? And this is, this is especially a, a very difficult textual question because in that very same passage, in verse 17, he says he's not come to do away with one jot or one tittle. So how can he then turn around and a few verses later start changing things, saying, you have heard it said, but I say. Now that we have heard the words of Yeshua in his own language, we understand that he is consistent in his obedience and support of the Torah. He commanded his followers to do what Moses instructed, but he emphatically warned them not to follow the Takanot and Maasim of the Pharisees because of their blatant violation of the commandment to never add to nor subtract from the Torah. This is the very reason why neither they nor their followers will have a place in the kingdom of heaven. This is a stern warning, 
for all of the tens of thousands of Christian denominations that add their own rules and regulations of righteousness while ignoring the entire Torah itself. Those who favor man-made religious systems, which use the name of Jesus, yet ignore the commandments of the Almighty, may be in for a rude awakening of their own on Judgment Day. Join us again next time for episode eight in the 10-part series, Raiders of the Lost Book, discoveries in the ancient Hebrew text of Matthew's Gospel. This is Michael Rood in the Galilee, bidding you shalom, peace, and I will see you when the smoke clears.